I wish everybody a, a, a good evening and um, this uh, evening session is following along from the uh, uh, day long we had on the theme of living well, dying well but I also understand that uh, a few extra people have uh, joined us this evening who weren't here during the day so I'll try to both lead on a little bit from the day's uh, teachings and uh, reflections and also as an uh, address of uh, another a couple of uh, aspects this evening and then particularly open things up for questions and responses um, and so that uh, uh, that will be the, the la uh, last part of the evening we'll try to leave plenty of time uh, for that Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddham dhamansa Sankhang Namasami. So I hope people can hear me clearly enough. People at the back, is this uh, loud enough, clear enough? Yes? Okay. Thank you. So uh, today, uh, the, the last part of the, the session, this afternoon, uh, we had uh, what is known as a, a death rehearsal. And... Uh, I uh, encouraged four particular contemplations uh, during that time to uh, things to look at, uh, aspects of, of our lives uh, to, to look at, to explore and to let go of, uh, say particularly before the last breath comes, but also to help us uh, to be living well as well as dying well, to get to know where the areas of attachment are. So these four areas that I suggested were well, first of all to look at the, um, the resentments that we have re with respect to other people, our family, the people we've grown up with, the people in our society, the people in roles of leadership and government and so on. And then the second contemplation was um, to reflect upon those uh, outside uh, influences of our life that we are very grateful, grateful for, people who have helped us enormously, uh, the Lord Buddha and uh, the uh, many uh, uh, members of the Sangha and great teachers and leaders of the Buddha Sasana over the centuries, uh, also our people in our families, people we've grown up with, people in the, uh, who've been school friends, uh, workmates and people in society and also uh, leaders of society who have been greatly beneficial and people who have been our Dhamma teachers um, guidance in uh, giving guidance in spiritual life meditation and uh, our, uh, say uh, uh, spiritual development people who have encouraged us and helped us uh, along the way so then the third contemplation was then looking at our own conduct and looking at what we regret from our early childhood uh, uh, through our adolescence and up to the present, looking at the things that we remember that we have done, things we said, things that we have, uh, have done that were cruel, that were dishonest, that were unkind, that were indulgent, that caused harm to other beings. So that this is to, to look at, not to create a feelings of guilt or fear, about uh, the consequences of those actions, but rather to, to uh, turn the attention towards those bitter memories or painful uh, memories of what we've said and done that was uh, unkind, that was selfish and, and cruel, uh, to forgive ourselves and to say, acknowledge the unskillfulness of what was done, but also to have compassion and forgiveness for this being and to let go of all of those uh, the uh, regrettable uh, actions and words that have come from our life. And then the last uh, of the four contemplations was that of uh, recollecting the good that we have done, 
to, what, uh, to practice what is called chaganusati. Chaga is generosity, um, and uh, that uh, it also just means uh, the general quality of, of unselfishness, uh, wholesomeness. So chaganusati is to recollect your own goodness, not to be inflated or proud or uh, to be um, egotistical, but to recognize the, the blessings of wholesome activity, the, the, uh, the brightness of heart, the punya uh, that, that uh, arises from wholesome and uh, uh, skillful action. And so that that uh, is, uh, say, I feel very important for us to do. Sometimes it's the hardest of the four is to recollect our own goodness and to appreciate that with an uh, even-minded uh, attitude. Then the, the last of the things I encouraged uh, us all to bring to mind was to let go of everything. Uh, and the, uh, the Buddha gave the advice as one is reaching the end of one's life to fix the attention on what is called Sakaya Nirodha, the cessation of identity, which is a, a very rarely used term in the Pali canon, in the Pali uh, texts. Um, uh, but in this one particular dialogue between the Buddha and his cousin Mahanama, this is the, the advice the Lord Buddha gives, is to, that uh, a lay person who fixes their mind on the cessation of identity, letting go of all identification, um, at that, that time and there's, uh, as he said, there's no difference in the state of liberation of that lay person that, uh, between their mind and the mind of a monk who has been an arahant for 100 years so that's a very emphatic statement on the part of the Lord Buddha So, and as I mentioned uh, earlier today, that's one of the very few references to a lay person becoming fully enlightened in the, uh, in the Pali Canon so, uh, uh, in respect to this also, um, uh, through the day I was talking about uh, other ways that we can uh, recognize the habits of clinging, grasping, attachment, upadana in the, in the Pali. Um, and uh, one of the, the, the statements I, I quoted from Ajahn Chah when people would come to visit uh, Wat Nong Bapong, his monastery, and uh, his, uh, <laughs> He would uh, ask the question, you know, have you come here to die? Which would be a little bit challenging or off-putting. And people say, no, 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 I've come here to be enlightened. I've come here to create merit. I've come here to, to train my mind. And he would say, well, it's better if you come here to die. <laughs> Not meaning physical death, but to, uh, uh, as they say, to let the uh, ego-centered habits, uh, the habits of Sakaya Ditti, self-view, let those die. And that's the the, uh, the great benefit of spiritual training to uh, to let go of a self-centered attitude towards life to establish a, a dhamma-centered or a nature-centered attitude towards life. So uh, I was uh, reflecting on that. Uh, so there was uh, uh, Venerable Ajahn Chah. I had the privilege of um, uh, being ordained by him as a novice and as a bhikkhu, uh, 1978-79. And, um, and training under his guidance. I didn't, I didn't live closely with him uh, very much. I was at a nearby monastery for the Westerners most of the time, but I, I was nearby and uh, was very, um, say, inspired by his teachings and the way of practice that he encouraged. So another of the things that he would uh, uh, ask when people came to the monastery, along with, did you come here to die? <laughs> uh, he would uh, ask the question. Uh, he would. He liked to, to put people on the spot. Uh, he didn't do much chit chat. <laughs> he wasn't the kind of a, a chit chat kind of a monk. He wanted to sort of get straight to the to the essence. And uh, so sometimes, just to complete strangers, uh, you know, he would uh, if people came to ask questions or to meet, uh, pay respects or to meet him, uh, he would sometimes ask them. Uh, he, he put them a, a puzzle to them, a, a kind of conundrum, a question, a puzzle. He'd say, if you can't go forwards and you can't go back and you can't stand still, where can you go? Oh, they, they think maybe, do I, do, am I understanding his dialect correctly? 
conquer forward, can't go back, can't stand still. Ah, Lung Ho, can you go sideways? No, can't go sideways either. Climb a tree? No, can't climb a tree, can't dig a hole, uh, and, and can't stand still either. And they come up with different ways of trying to resolve that puzzle, figure out the, 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 the question, what he meant. And he would, he would make you wriggle for a little bit, kind of <laughs> trying to find a, an answer, trying to find a way forward. And uh, then uh, he would say, "How? Yeah, as long as we think, or, uh, I, I wouldn't put words into his mouth, but the kind of thing he would say was that as long as we are attached to the body, to the personality, to the, what we call the five khandhas, uh, the body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, consciousness, as long as we are attached uh, to uh, the body, to time, to location, then uh, and to the five khandhas, then there's no way of solving this puzzle. But only if uh, we, uh, the mind lets go of its attachment to time, to location, to identity, to uh, the five khandhas, to the body and the personality, then that, uh, that um, puzzle uh, resolves itself. And he would uh, then say, you know, the Buddha Dharma is not to be mo- found in moving forwards, nor in moving backwards, nor in standing still. This is called the place of non-abiding. Uh, so that uh, to our ordinary thinking mind, that's like, oh, well, what's that? <laughs> We might still feel that we're in the dark, but uh, this I feel this is a very important teaching because it points to how we automatically, unconsciously think, I am here, I'm sitting in, in this monastery here in Singapore, yeah, and I'm looking towards all of you, you are sitting there and you are looking at me, I am here, you are there, right? <laughs> Time is passing, it's now uh, 7.45 in the evening. And June the 22nd, I think, (laughs) Uh, 2024. That's the time. This is where we are. Uh, And this is where I am sitting. This is where the the life is is happening. So what Lumpur Chai is saying is that as long as we take that experience of three-dimensional space, the passing of time, the location of the mind as in a particular spot from which we experience the world, uh, then that liberation is impossible. We're still seeing things in terms of self-view. It's only when the mind lets go of time, of identity, of location, then uh, liberation is possible. So we might, not, uh, we might not even realize there are those kinds of attachments, uh, th- those kinds of, of uh, say, uh, ha- habits of grasping, but uh, Lumpur uh, would put that to people and and help them to understand that oh yeah the ordinary everyday way you look at what you are uh, that has to be challenged that has to be say investigated uh, because the very first obstacle to enlightenment is self view and you can summarize the habits of Sakaya Ditti self view as I am the body. I am the personality. So, uh, in, uh, along with the theme of today about living well, dying well, uh, to to really investigate and look at those deep kinds of attachment, and to learn how to let go of them. This is really what helps us to live well and to die well, and also to to transcend both living and dying, to awaken to that reality which is unborn, undying. Uh, and uh, that which is beyond birth, naturally beyond birth and death, to to awaken to the Dhamma itself. So that 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 puzzle that Lumpur Cha would put to people, that is, uh, I say, closely related to one of the Sutta teachings from a collection called the Udana, and uh, some of you might be very familiar with this. It's chapter eight of the U- Udana, and it's the first the first sutta, the first teaching in the chapter 8, um, uh, it's called Patali Village is the name of, the, uh, of the, the chapter. These teachings seem to have all been given in Patali Gama, this, um, uh, this particular place, which is now the, the great city of Patna, 
I believe it's uh, the same place, Parthali Gama. Anyway, so this teaching says, uh, uh, the Buddha says, uh, and it was a kind of declaration, there is the ayatana, that sphere of being, that quality of being, um, where there is no earth, no water, no fire, no wind. The four elements uh, are not there. Uh, there is no, um, no sun, no, no moon, no uh, dying, no reappearance. Um, th this uh, ayatana, this, this sphere of being, um, there is no coming, no going, no standing still. It has no basis, no evolution, and no support. This, I tell you, is the end of dukkha, the end of suffering. So to our ego, to uh, uh, the habits of self-view, like no sun, no moon, no earth, no water, no fire, no wind, oh, that sounds a bit off-putting. <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> uh, but uh, he also says, uh, uh, notably, that is the, the end of suffering, the end of dukkha. So uh, in that kind of very direct teaching, He's saying there is this dimension of our own being. It's not, not some kind of mysterious heaven or, or other realm, some other place. This is an aspect of your own mind, your own jitta, right now, already. <laughs> there is that dimension of our own heart, our own being, which is uh, um, where earth, water, fire and wind have no, uh, no substance, they have no landing place, uh, where sun and moon uh, are not felt and there is no darkness either in, in a similar sutta he says there is no sun, no moon and no darkness <laughs> uh, there is no basis, no evolution no support, no coming, no going no standing still so to our ordinary thinking mind which is conditioned by the passing of time and, we, and sort of living in three dimensional space what, what can that be? how can that be? what is that? Uh, but when we develop the practice of insight meditation, then it begins to be the, the wisdom faculty of the heart is, uh, is cultivated. And there's a recognition that, um, well, we talk about the passing of time, but the experience of reality is always present. The Dhamma is timeless, a kaliko. And even though we talk about here and there, and we see uh, and refer to things in terms of three-dimensional space uh, in many respects. The mind does not have any location. It doesn't exist anywhere. Awareness does not apply. If you think about it, uh, uh, the, the uh, aspect of space applies to rupakanda, material form, the, the physical world, but mind, where does your mind stop and mind begin? Awareness doesn't really apply, does it? The mind is not anywhere. So I realize these are quite refined concepts and you might be thinking, oh, I came to the wrong place for my Sunday evening. <laughs> this is too much. But, uh, and so if you are feeling that, then that's a feeling to observe. <laughs> but I, I do feel in, in the light of the teachings so, and the, the uh, theme for today's um, uh, uh, say meditation and uh, dharma reflections, living well and dying well. This aspect of really uh, bringing the attention to the habits of self-view, of eye making and mind making, and recognizing that needs to be challenged. When we say, "I am a man, I am a human being, I am a woman, I am old, I am young, I am British, I am Singaporean, I am Malaysian," yeah, I. Uh, uh, I'm a doctor, I'm a monk, I'm a, I'm a, a teacher, you know, I, I'm a monastery helper. That's what I am. To, to, uh, uh, to really fulfill the, the purpose of today's theme and practice, then we need to rouse that wisdom of our own jitta that says, wait a minute, <laughs> saying I am a man or I am British, that's a convenient fiction. Say I am a Theravada monk, I'm a Theravada monk because I took part in a ceremony with Venerable Ajahn Chah on April the 7th, 1979. So certain verses of Pali were, were, were recited, and there was a certain amount of bowing and uh, paying respects and questions and responses, and at the end, bhikkhu. 
It's a human agreement. It's a collection of noises that we make, actions that we perform, uh, attitudes of mind and intentions. Put them all together and we say, uh, novice before, monk after. But the, these are just agreements, they're just conventions. There isn't any real absolute monk. So, uh, and Lumpo Chao would also say, you sit in a, an assembly like this and say, there are no men here, there are no women, there are no nuns, no monks. These are all just karmic formations uh, coming and going and changing. There's no, there's, there, are no, there are no monks and nuns here. There's no, uh, uh, there's no people. Really? <laughs> what's, what's he seeing that I'm not seeing? <laughs> but he would be speaking the, 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 the clear and, and the practical truth in making those kind of statements that we have these convenient fictions, say, here is a woman, here is a man, here is a layperson, here is a nun, here is a monk. These are conventions. You know, the, the, the skin of my body doesn't know it's Theravadan Buddhist. My, my, my toenails don't know that they, they are British. <laughs> They're just the elements, uh, the keratin uh, the, the, uh, that make up the nails. It's just a chemical compound. It's not British, it's not Theravadan. Yeah. Do, do the tiles of this, uh, of this building know that they are, they are Mahayana tiles? No, we, we say this is a Mahayana temple. Uh, it's a, that's a, a, a way of labeling this particular collection of buildings and the, the great amount of effort and energy putting them together, looking after them, using them for particular purposes, so we say Mahayana Buddhist temple. But you know, even the Buddha image doesn't know it's a Buddha. <laughs> it's just material form. We give it the name Buddha, Buddha Rupa, Buddha image. That's what the, the human beings label that image, but in, its, in and of itself, it's not a Buddha. <laughs> so the, in and of itself, the things that make up our bodies and our minds, they are not personal, they're all aspects of nature. They are Dhamma Jati, born of the Dhamma. So uh, in order to free the heart from its attachments, its entanglements, the clinging, it's important to know what the entanglements are, <laughs> to recognize the, and to challenge those, uh, those, uh, those automatic ideas. I am a woman, I am a man, I am 67 years old, I am British, I am Singaporean, I am, I am tall, I am short, I am hungry, I am sick, I am healthy. All those I ams, every single one of them said, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute, let's just look, let's explore. Look, oh, and then uh, when that uh, uh, say capacity to wisely reflect, the, uh, uh, the ability to use wisdom is brought to those uh, ways of judging ourselves and other beings, the material world, the mental world, and uh, that wait a minute is followed up and there's an investigation uh, what we call yoni so manasikara, looking at the origin, the sources of things, then there's a change of view, there's a change of heart, there's a recognition that, oh, calling this a building. This, is, it, this doesn't know it's a building. <laughs> we call it a building uh, because of, uh, of the, the particular form and our human agreements and the way we humans use it, but um, to, the, to the, the, you know, the spiders and lizards who live around the edges and are you know, hiding away in the shadows, <laughs> this, is, this is their home. <laughs> they don't think of it as a building or a Mahayana temple. Uh, it's, uh, it's labeled in a different way. So, when that recognition of this, these are convenient fictions, is, uh, that investigation is applied, then the change of heart that goes, oh, that's right, aha. In that moment, the view is a bit broader. Uh, the mind has let go of its attachment to conventions, its attachment to the habitual ways of seeing things. So the more that can be applied, uh, and also in these very refined areas of, of life, the attachment to three-dimensional space, the passing of time, the, the sense of 
uh, of, of, um, of the mind being located in a particular place. You know, here, I, uh, I am here. Uh, if those are all challenged, and the, the mind begins to get a perspective on that, then uh, the genuine quality of liberation can be actualized. And that was, I, I would feel, exactly what Venerable Ajahn Chah was aiming at in challenging people. Like, if you can't go forward, you can't go backwards, you can't stand still, where can you go? Uh, when, uh, just before his health collapsed in 1981, so that's uh, more than 40 years ago now, uh, he sent a letter to Ajahn Sumedho in England, and Ajahn Chah had never written a letter to Ajahn Sumedho ever before. <laughs> and he'd, uh, he'd dictated it to one of the Western monks who was staying with him. And so the letter began with, yeah, Ajahn Sumedho, you're never going to believe this, but, uh, but Lung Po Chah asked me to take his dictation today. He asked to dic dictate a letter to you. And so, uh, so here is what he asked me to, to write. And the letter said, uh, uh, so this was really the final instruction that Venerable Ajahn Chah gave to his so chief Western disciple. Uh, so just started up this new monastery, Chithurst Monastery in, in England. And so this was the last message Lung Po gave before his health collapsed. He said, whenever you have feelings of love or hate for anything whatsoever, these will be your aids and partners in building paramita spiritual virtues. The Buddha Dharma is not to be found in moving forwards, nor in moving backwards, nor in standing still. This, Sumato, is your place of non-abiding. So if Lumpo Cha realized his health was collapsing, he wouldn't see Ajahn Sumato again, he wouldn't have a chance to talk to him. You think, okay, my chief Western disciple has started up this new monastery, I should send him a list of do's and don'ts. You know, do this, do, 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 do this, don't, 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 don't. Kind of final instructions, you'd think. Most of us would do that. Okay, just to get the message across, we spell it all out. But Ajahn Chah, being the, the wise being that uh, he was, he, he boiled it all down. And rather than do this, don't do that, and uh, spelling out, he saw that as long as Ajahn Sumato embodies that place of non-abiding, uh, then things will work out well. <laughs> the result of not attaching to being somebody going somewhere and doing something, uh, the result of that achievement of the heart, the heart awake to the Dhamma itself, which is timeless, unlocated and non-personal, then the best that can happen will be what arises from your presence, your actions, your, your words. And so that, that was an extraordinarily wise and amazing teaching to me. And uh, I, was, I was there when Ajahn Sumato received that letter. And he literally sort of uh, 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 right uh, beside him as he opened it up and, and read it. Uh, and so that uh, as a, a memory I have uh, directly of that. And so, uh, to me, that's a really good advice for all of us. If we want to live well, to find within our own heart, our own mind, that place which is neither going forwards nor moving backwards nor standing still, that place of non-abiding, which is, uh, I would say, is the place of being mindfully, awakefully aware in, in, the, in the present. Uh, again, as uh, Lumpur uh, Sumedha would say, if we think in terms of me and my problems, then there's never a coming to the end of them. We think, uh, instead, rather than me and my problems, or I'm a, an unenlightened person who's got to do something now in order to become an enlightened person in the future, you say, no, we need to change the paradigm, we need to cha change the framework. But you might think, but I am an unenlightened person, and I do have to do something now to become enlightened in the future, don't I? But if you notice, that's putting our, the, uh, the practice into the framework of me as a person, who is a, an unenlightened person, and in the framework of time. So he would say, rather than saying, I'm an unenlightened person who's got to do something now to become enlightened in the future, or I, I'm seeing things in terms of me and my problems, be awake now, or be wakefulness now. 
be awake now in this moment and when that is embodied that wakefulness that wake wakeful aware quality is embodied and that is uh, uh, realized in this moment then there's the recognition of the, the mind that knows the world is not limited by the world this mind this awareness of ours that knows our own body knows the, the place where we are uh, that mind which knows the world is not limited or burdened by the world the, the, this which knows the person and the personal is not uh, limited by what it's aware of uh, the awareness is that this which knows the person is not a person it transcends personality it's not confined by time or space uh, or I identity so I do realize these are refined concepts and this is all being recorded so you can play it back and listen to it watch it again think wait a minute I didn't get that so it can be reviewed but I do feel that uh, in terms of helping us to fulfill the intention that we'd you know you all signed up for today or came along to this evening talk to uh, to make it fully worthwhile and to fulfill those intentions those aspirations that we there is a need to look at these very deeply rooted refined areas of attachment and Ajahn Chah would, would put that kind of puzzle to any you know, kind of anybody who showed up <laughs> but you didn't have to be a, an experienced meditator or a, a, a someone who studied Buddhist philosophy or knew Abhidhamma just you know if you're one of the locals you know, come in from the, your kind of garage in, you know, that you run in the, in the local town or a rice, you know, a rice farmer, you know, you're a mother with eight children you'd say, yeah, if you can't go forward, you can't go back, you can't stand still, where can you go? <laughs> so it doesn't take a lot of information or qualifications uh, but really our own uh, readiness to, to explore, to understand this life of ours and even though it might sound a bit, you know, very a bit refined or a bit kind of spaced out, letting go of time and space and and identity, but woo, when that is, uh, when that place of non-abiding, non-abiding is 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 found, we we know if we know and and say uh, live life from that place, then uh, a great variety of wholesome qualities arise from that we learn how to live really well and so that when um, the, the Buddha's stepmother uh, Mahapajapati Gotami was asking him for advice shortly after uh, her ordination as a bhikkhuni then uh, she said how do we know what's a, a good path to follow and what's not good, what, what's good teaching, what's not good teaching uh, and so uh, the Buddha spelled out and it's very, uh, very useful teaching of these eight qualities that he spelled out to uh, Mahapajapati Gotami, his foster mother and aunt, um, which I would say is the natural result of uh, embodying that quality of wakeful awareness, being awake now. So he said, if a teaching, uh, if it leads to uh, simplicity rather than complexity, then that's probably a good teaching to follow. If it leads to dispassion rather than passion, then it's probably a good teaching to follow. If it leads to fewness of needs, not being, uh, uh, say, needy, or having to have a lot of stuff around to, to, to make you feel comfortable, to make you feel okay, to be one of few needs, uh, if it, uh, it, then it's probably a good teaching to follow. If it makes you uh, uh, more needy and need a lot of stuff, uh, then it's not going to be a good teaching to follow. If it helps you to be unburdensome, not a bother or a difficulty to others, if you, you make yourself easy to look after, easy to take care of, then that's uh, uh, likely to be a, a helpful teaching to follow. So if it leads to uh, uh, the, uh, the quality of energy, so uh, energetic engagement, uh, then it's going to be a, a, a helpful teaching rather than leading to laziness or, or slackness. Um, so that uh, 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 the, these, say, 
a natural inclination towards simplicity, to being uh, uh, having a life that's uncluttered, uh, to a life that is energetic and engaged. Um, these are all natural qualities that arise from that, that root of wakeful awareness, and that the uh, that faculty of the heart, we call so called vijja, the uh, awake aware quality, awakened awareness, the vijja dhatu, the element of wakefulness. So these are, um, I would say, the uh, as signs that if you are looking to uh, to see, well, how can I live? Well? How can I live well? <laughs> How can, I, how can I benefit my own life? Uh, what choices should I make? Uh, then these, the kind of guidance that the Buddha gave to Mahapajapati Gotami uh, in that, that teaching, these are helpful things to follow, helpful principles to follow. If it leads to simplicity, it leads to being unburdened, it leads to, uh, to, to energy, it leads to uh, say a fewness of needs, it leads to not being a bother to others, uh, then these are the kind of signs that, okay, if, if, I, if I follow this track, then my life is going to be more comfortable, easier, more beneficial, and I'm going to make less problems for myself. So that, that kind of living well, uh, living effectively, and, um, and living in a way that supports wholesomeness and uh, and well-being, and these are you know, simple guidelines uh, to follow. Maybe the last thing to, to share before we have the time for some questions is um, uh, one of the principal ways of living well is uh, the company that you keep. Who do you choose to spend your time with? Uh, uh, there's a very uh, s uh, strong uh, sense of, of fellowship, I, I feel, in the Buddha Dharma Foundation, and there's a of you who have also come along uh, today for this event. Um, so this kind of drawing close to good-hearted people is extremely important. In uh, uh, a teaching that the, the Buddha gave, when he, he outlines the, the, the cause or the fuel, that which supports ignorance, uh, avijja, so not seeing clearly, not being awake, un unawakenedness. <laughs> Uh, then uh, he makes a, a very interesting and very beautiful comparison. He says, uh, he, and it's probably the only place in the whole of the Pali Canon where he spells out what is the cause or the source or where, where ignorance uh, comes from in, in, in great detail. It's, it's only a couple of places where he talks about that. This particular sutta, it's called the Ignorance Sutta. Uh, um, it's in the Book of the Tens in the Numerical Discourses, uh, Sutta number 61, I believe. And anyway, so the advice to go to me is in the Book of the Eights, Numerical Discourses, Sutta number 53, if you want to follow that up, is advice to go to me. Uh, so anyway, this, uh, the Ignorance Sutta, he starts off by saying, so what is the fuel, what is the support, what is the, the, the cause for ignorance to be sustained? He says it's uh, the five hindrances, sense desire, ill will, uh, uh, restlessness, uh, dullness, and doubt, the five nivarana. So they said, what is the fuel, what is the source, what's the support for the five hindrances? Uh, and he says it's uh, uh, the five unwholesome uh, kinds of action, unwholesomeness in thought, unwholesomeness in word and wholesomeness indeed. That's the fuel, that's the support, the power source for the five hindrances. Then he says, well, what's the, 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 what's the fuel, what's the support for those three kinds of unwholesomeness, unwholesomeness in thought, speech, and, and action? And he says, lack of sense restraint, which is, uh, as I was saying earlier today, living reactively rather than responsively. If we lack sense restraint, we, we see something we like, we chase after it. We see something we dislike and we kind of attack it or, or run away from it. So that's being reactive rather than responsive. So we, in the Pali we say a lack of indriya sanvara, a lack of sense restraint. Then he says, so what's, this, what's the fuel, what's the source for the, the lack of sense restraint, for being unrestrained in the senses? And he says, it's a, um, a, a lack of mindfulness and full awareness, 
the, uh, the absence of sati sampajanya. So, what's the fuel? What's the, the, the support? The uh, the source uh, of uh, a lack of mindfulness and full awareness. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, he says is a, a lack of wise reflection. Yoni so manasikara. What's the source? What's, what's the source? What's the support? What's the fuel for not reflecting wisely by unwise reflection? He says it's a lack of faith. No sadha, uh, the a lack of faith, a lack of, of confidence in spiritual reality. So, what's the source? What's the support for for the lack of faith? Having no sadha, no faith. It says not listening to good teachings, sadhamma savana. And then, what is the the cause? What's the source? The the support for for not hearing good teachings. He says not associating with good people, sakuri sangseva. And he said just as uh, the rain falls onto the hilltops and forms into little puddles. The puddles form into streamlets. They, f- they flow down to the, the bigger ponds. The ponds form into bigger streams and the streams feed the rivers. The rivers feed the ocean and the ocean is filled up. So too, ignorance is filled up through, uh, and it's very, a very root, not drawing close to good people. But if we draw close to good people, and I would say gathering together for this Sunday to reflect on life and death and uh, living well and dying well uh, that if we draw close to good people sapuri sang seva then we create the opportunity for hearing good teachings wise teachings if we listen to wise teachings this supports the quality of faith with faith being supported then uh, that leads to wise reflection yoni so manasikara with wise reflection that leads to the support of mindfulness and full awareness. Mindfulness and full awareness leads to us being responsive rather than reactive, a sense restraint rather than uh, reactivity with respect to the senses. And then uh, when we are, uh, sen- when the, re- the senses are restrained, when we are responsive, that leads to wholesomeness in thought, word, and action. Then wholesomeness in thought, word, and action, that's the fuel, that's the support for the four foundations of mindfulness. The four foundations of mindfulness are the support, they are the fuel for the seven factors of enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment, they are the fuel, they are the support for the, uh, the, the uh, knowledge of uh, liberate, uh, uh, the full knowledge of, um, of uh, say, uh, vision and liberation. The uh, uh, vimuti jnana dasana, the knowledge and vision of liberation. And so, just as the ocean is filled up, <laughs> just as the rain falls on the mountains and, and uh, the whole uh, s- the collection of, uh, s- of little puddles and streams uh, form into rivers and fill up the ocean, so too the knowledge and vision of liberation is filled up uh, with, with that association with good people at the source. So, uh, I can repeat that whole sutta as... Uh, 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 in detail because I feel it's really important. So if we want to live well and then be able to die well, to let go of, and let go of birth and death altogether, then at the very root is the, the people you spend your time with. Who do you choose to be close to? Uh, and that that is what helps us so much. So drawing close to each other, uh, being guided, being supported, by a wise friends, Kalyanamita, this is how we uh, boost uh, the quality of vijja, and we rep- we deprive avijja of its fuel, and so we are putting the odds in the favour of liberation rather than uh, greater ignorance and therefore dukkha. So I uh, offer these thoughts for consideration this evening, and I open things up for for questions from everybody. Andamaya Namagata Yasa Dukara Radama Se Sadu 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 Anumodami. So I hope we've got some uh, wandering microphones that can go around uh, the room. So. Uh, uh, I open things up for questions from the floor. 
If there are any questions, please don't be shy. If everyone has got beyond doubt, then that's a wonderful thing. There is actually a standing mic uh, right in the middle aisle. Uh, you could uh, come up to the, the microphone and ask the question. No sound yet. Yeah. I don't think it's working. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Ajahn. Thank you very much for uh, the evening talk. So, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, in terms of non-self, um, uh, part of the uh, chant that we do is to say that we are the heir of our karma and the actions that we create. So, is the self to be found in the karma uh, that we bring from life to life? And if that's not correct, uh, how can we understand uh, whether, uh, what's the relation of karma to ourselves? Thank you. Yeah, very good question. Uh, you can sit down. Okay. <laughs> You're safe now. So, uh, yeah, uh, we, at the beginning of the day, I don't know if you were here throughout the day, but at the beginning of the day, part of the morning chanting is um, uh, rupang anatta, vedana anatta, you know, the body is not self, feelings are not self, perceptions are not self, mental formations are not self. So we didn't do the, uh, we didn't have the chant of the five subjects for frequent recollection, but I did mention them during the day. So in those reflections, uh, you, it, the Buddha starts off with the position of ignorance. So it, uh, you're starting off from the habits of self-view. I am of the nature to age, I am of the nature to sicken, I am of the nature to die, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I'm the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma, abide supported by my karma. Whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. So there's a lot of I. <laughs> uh, and so. Uh, but that's right next to saying the body is not self, feelings are not self, perceptions are not self. <laughs> so how do those fit together? Well, the, the I am the owner of my karma is the conventional truth, the, sam, the samuti satcha, so the, the convenient fiction. I, uh, I am of the nature to age. The, the body is aging, and as long as there's identification with the body, then it feels like I am aging. The body is aging, but also the body is not self. So from the uh, paramata satya, the ultimate perspective, that uh, then there, I, I am not aging. <laughs> their, their, the, their body is aging, but the body is not self. So the, the what we call the two levels of truth uh, are being embodied there. So when uh, we talk about karma, then uh, the uh, and Ever since the Buddha's time, people are asking, how does the teaching on cause and effect, karma and vipaka, karma and its results, how does that relate to the teachings on not-self? So it's uh, uh, just as the body can seem to be who and what we are, but when it's, it's looked at and known with wisdom, it's recognized, oh, the body belongs to nature. It's not me, it it's not a self, doesn't belong to a self. So similarly, karma, uh, cause and effect. Um, it's not a person, doesn't belong to a person. An action is taken based on a, an intention and there's a result that comes from that action uh, that matches the intention uh, and uh, the results will, uh, will arise sooner or later according to uh, in un incalculable numbers of factors. But that isn't a person, doesn't belong to a person. But where the action was taken is where the result will be felt. If that makes sense. So that um, uh, yeah. if, uh, oh, how can I explain this? So that um, if, if, I, if I pick up this object, this is a, a wet towel, so then you know, my fingers feel a sense of cloth and wetness. Your fingers don't because the action has happened here, it didn't happen there. 
So even though the body is not self, uh, feelings are not self, sensations are not self, <laughs> none of this is, is, is a per- belongs to a personal. Uh, the, the result is felt here because the cause was created here. So that um, uh, that is, uh, in a way, the laws of physics and chemistry. That's how, how it works. Um, so that it, uh, on a conventional level, if that, this makes sense, then you say, oh, this person carried out the action, that person will experience the result. So that's a convenient fiction, it's a figure of speech. But it's describing uh, because uh, an action uh, happened here, like if a, if a tile fell off the roof on that side, you wouldn't hear the sound coming from over there. The tile, land, landed, uh, the tile landed over there, it would be louder in, our, in, in one ear than the other, right? It's just laws of physics and chemistry. That's how it works. So that the action happens there, that's where the result. That the falling of the tile happened there, the crashing of the tile to the, to the ground, and the sound it makes happens there. So that's how, uh, say, karma and its results are experienced in, in our lives. And so that um, when the, uh, the Buddha was asked the question by Vachagota, so what is it that sustains a being when one life comes to an end and another life begins? What is it that sustains a being between one life and the next? And the Buddha gives this very interesting example. He says it's like a forest fire. When flames leap from one tree to another, they are sustained by the air. So he knew about oxygen as well. <laughs> so that the the flame uh, is a tanupadana. So that the the fuel is the air. And interestingly, the word upadana means fuel uh, as well as clinging. Um, it's exactly the same word. Upadana means like the the fuel for a fire. So when we say the the panchupadana kanda means that the five bundles of fuel as well as the five uh, areas of grasping so like a bundle of firewood or you know uh, uh, five cans of petrol so fuel and so then the Buddha says in exactly the same way Vacha when one life has come to an end and uh, another life before another life begins what sustains a being between lives is, is craving Tanupadana. Craving is the fuel. So whatever the mind is attached to, that is what sustains the kind of uh, the aggregate of a being from one life to the next. So whatever we love, whatever we hate, whatever is familiar, that's what will tend. Uh, as long as that is attached to and identified with, identified with, that will be what conditions the the uh, the the next birth. Uh, that's what sustains a being from one birth to the next. So, what is reborn is habits, not not a person or anything that belongs to a person, not an I or a me or a mine. So, I hope that uh, clarifies things a bit for you. So, please, uh, anybody else? Um, hi, Ajahn. Uh, I have a question that I actually wrote down earlier, but I thought it might be better to ask verbally. So I could put more, uh, more context into it. So um, previously we chant that um, you know the one that does not hold on to fixed views, uh, but who by not holding on to fixed views, the pure-hearted one is not born again into this world. And uh, you also earlier mentioned uh, Ajahn Chah's teachings on not uh, moving forward backwards or staying still, but instead um, practicing non-abiding. But I've been struggling with this teaching because. Um, especially with the current uh, geopolitical conditions and climate conditions of the world. Um, there are many, I think, worthy causes and people that I would like to support, whether um, to use the word self-righteously out of uh, compassion or empathy or otherwise, such as um, people say that you should use your platform to speak up about the issue of Palestine conflict, or about climate change, or about LGBTQ issues, as um, I find it very hard to uh, not have certain views on what is right and not right, 
and um, I feel a certain sense of guilt when I try to maintain my own peace by not uh, speaking up about these topics. When I feel that um, this peace is only possible for me because I am not currently the one going through these issues. But if one day I were to go through similar issues, I'm not sure if uh, trying to maintain peacefulness by not engaging with such political issues would become people critical of me. So I wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please you do feel free to sit down. So, uh, a very similar question came up, I think, at the Nibbana Centre. Uh, was that just yesterday? Wow. <laughs> it's been a long day today. Um, so yeah, the, yesterday evening at the Nibbana Center, a very similar question came up. So when we talk about uh, non-attachment or say not holding to fixed views, it doesn't mean not using views or not having views, but it's not clinging to them. And uh, not uh, say using them as a weapon, but uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the key piece in that is not holding, not holding to fixed views like, I'm right, you're wrong, but we can still have the sense this is a wholesome way forward, and that seems very clear to me, uh, and so that uh, non-attachment can be uh, not just resulting, it doesn't mean being passive, it doesn't mean not taking action. Uh, non-attachment can, uh, can uh, as I was saying yesterday, it can result in being ready to take more action, being more outspoken, so that you're, uh, you're, you don't attach to your hesitancy or your, your fear of, of being criticized, but rather uh, non-attachment can result in taking more action <laughs> and being more engaged and being, uh, more take, taking more initiative. So uh, very, very often pe when you talk about non-attachment and disentanglement, um, and not, you know, not going forward, not going backwards, not standing still, these kind of things. It can seem like a kind of passivity or trying to freeze yourself or, or, or be, be nobody. I am nobody. I, that kind of... But I would say that's a vibhavatana, it's an attachment to nihilism or a, a kind of passivity, a, num a numbing or a, a, a false disconnection. The, the Buddha's experience of enlightenment under the Bodhi tree resulted in him taking a lot of action, a lot of very radical action, going against the whole caste system, uh, ordaining women uh, as monastics, starting a, a, um, a, a monastic order and, uh, a, 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 and teaching a huge variety of people, establishing the whole array of Dhamma teachings. That's a lot of initiative. That's a lot of creative thought, that's a lot of doing, but it was without any fixed, uh, without clinging, without grasping. So things that we can see as being uh, skillful means, wholesome kinds of work uh, in the world, then um, it's totally appropriate to engage in those, but if we, uh, that engagement, as long as that engagement is not based on self-view, but it's based on a, a mindful attunement to the time, the place, the situation, then rather than that uh, non-attachment or not being born again into the, uh, being resu resulting in sort of disconnection or ab ab abstraction, being abstracted from the, the society and, and such, it can result in uh, a great deal of creative engagement. Uh, and courage, yeah, that uh, you find you let go of your your fearfulness. What you what you are not attached to is your fearfulness. <laughs> uh, and in this, uh, I like to quote a. Um, uh, uh, there was a, in the entrance exams to Oxford and Cambridge, they have what they call a a. a um, the they have the you know, a test in your in, in your subject. And they also have a, um, uh, a, a three-hour exam, which is um, a kind of an open paper, just the random questions you're asked and you're, uh, and you're invited to write freely about um, any particular subject. And the questions are very, very varied and they're quite sort of provocative. 
same way we like something like, what's wrong with the French? <laughs> oh. Oh. Or um, <clears throat> if Julius Caesar hadn't been killed, what would have happened to the Roman Empire? These kind of things, just using your imagination. And so uh, one of the questions, uh, and, and that um, it's extremely rare to get high marks in that, in a, let alone full, you know, full marks in that, in that paper. Um, and one of the questions uh, when, many years ago was, what is bravery? What is bravery? And the person wrote a two-word answer, this is. <laughs> and she got, the, she got full marks <laughs> for that, uh, that answer, which is extremely rare. And uh, okay, that's, that's it, yeah. You know, your whole possibility of entering Cambridge University depends on uh, getting, passing this paper as well as your subject. So you're risking everything. It's brave. <laughs> so here it is. So that kind of um, non-attachment <laughs> uh, is a part of the, of the Buddhist practice, I would say. I would say that was a very Buddhist answer to me. So I hope that clarifies things a little bit for you. So please, any other questions? There's someone else coming in. Yeah, please come to the microphone. Good evening, Ajahn. May I know how to like reduce body sufferings? Because I experience like headache, soreness and stuff. Yeah, so should I be mindful or do no attachment? Thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, with respect to physical pain, uh, the, the Buddha gave a very, a very short but very useful, uh, very significant teaching called the arrow. It's called the Sala Sutta. Sala is the word for an arrow or a dart. And uh, he uses the image of a soldier being shot on the battlefield. Um, so uh, he says physical pain is like the soldier being shot with the first arrow. Nobody can avoid being hit by that, that first arrow. Even the Buddha himself, he had chronic back pain. So when he was an old man, he said, uh, I'm, uh, the only way I can experience comfort is to ab completely absorb my mind into emptiness, to the sunyata vihara. Uh, as long as he was paying attention to his, his body in the sense world, it was painful. So the Buddha had chronic pain as an ongoing experience. Um, so nobody, no being can avoid that first arrow of physical pain. If you have a body and a mind, it's going to be, there's going to be pain. So the first arrow is unavoidable. The second arrow uh, says that is the mind proliferating around that painful feeling, negotiating, worrying, resenting, uh, feeling aversion, anxiety, um, that all of that cloud of negativity and agitation around the painful feeling. And that uh, second arrow can be completely avoided. So when we talk about ending suffering, Dukkha Nirodha, it's all about the second arrow, not the first. So as I like to say, any of you who've come along hoping the ending of suffering means no physical pain, you came to the wrong place. So uh, that's, not, that's not on offer. Uh, but we can, like the Lord Buddha, he had chronic back pain, so it was painful, but he didn't make a problem out of it. He took action to work with it. He was, sometimes he'd be giving a Dhamma talk, as I mentioned at the, at the uh, I think at the Nibbana Center yesterday, uh, that uh, he was ready to take action. He'd be giving a Dhamma talk and he'd turn to Mahakachana or to Ananda, sorry, Puta, Mughala and say, uh, Kachana, my back is paining me. I'm going to lie down and, and rest it and stretch my back. The assembly is still wide awake. Please carry on giving a Dhamma talk. So he'd interrupt a Dhamma talk to go and stretch his back. This is the Buddha. The, <laughs> our Lord Buddha had back, you know, would, would, would recognize the, the pain in his back is getting his attention the, uh, and uh, out of kindness to his body he would then stop giving a talk 
go and lie down, stretch his back and uh, relax it a bit and uh, have somebody else carry on giving a Dhamma talk. So the Buddha was ready to take action to help relieve the pain but still wasn't making a problem out of it. So I feel this is a really, these are important principles. So with respect to your question, uh, I hope that um, gives you a few pointers that uh, uh, the, to distinguish between the first arrow and the second arrow, that's a really helpful distinction to make and that realizing that we can experience pain and it can be absolutely not a problem. We can do something about it to the best we can, but, he, uh, but still um, be uh, at peace with it even as we take action to help relieve it. We don't have to be hoping that it's going to come to an end and being waiting for the, the pain to go away, but we're just do, doing what we can to work with it. And if it fades away, okay. If it doesn't fade away, okay. So I see another person up at the yes. microphone. Because I always uh, walk very slow, so we have to stand here. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, today topic is uh, living well and dying well. Mm -hmm. So, but this afternoon we do an exercise. Mm -hmm. I mean, of dying well, you know. <coughs> but in reality, when people die, there will be a lot of suffering. You know, there will be <coughs> confusion, loss of mind, you know, and pain, and something else. Uh. So, what is your advice? to those who may not be dying well. <coughs> so they may have a better life. Oh, sorry. They may have a better death and after. Well, uh, as I... Uh, please, please sit down. If you don't. So, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, uh, I don't know if you were around during today, but I, uh, early on this morning I spoke about the Buddha's advice to Nakula Pita. He said... Uh, better to be afflicted in body and not afflicted in mind than to be afflicted in mind and not afflicted in the body. So I've been with a, a number of people as they are dying, um, uh, oftentimes with, uh, with considerable physical pain or agitation in the body. Um, but uh, my experience has been that the attitude is really the key thing when I was with somebody who was in a hospice in San Francisco as, as he was dying from cancer, um, his breath sounded really terrible. It was really um, challenging to be in the room and hearing his kind of choking breath and kind of gurgling of the lungs and, and so that it was quite disturbing, challenging to, to hear that. Um, and so I kept having this feeling, oh dear, uh, what, what can we do or how can we help him. But then, as I looked at my reaction, I thought, well, hang on a minute, just calm down. <laughs> don't, don't, get, uh, don't panic too much. And I noticed that even though that his breath sounded really terrible and really, uh, un, uh, really forced, the atmosphere in the room was extremely peaceful. And that uh, the, uh, and the expression on his face was also quite, quite, quite calm, quite peaceful. Because in the dying process, there's a, 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 sl a steady disconnection of the, the awareness from what the body is doing. And there's a kind of in and out. It depends, of course, how quickly the dying process is happening. But if one is dying from an illness, uh, then the, uh, many of the people I've been with as they are dying, there's a kind of in and out process, at times when they're close, more closely connected to the body and its feelings, and other times when the mind is not. It's just, it's, it's sort of let go of the body quite, quite substantially. They're still alive, the heart is still beating, the lungs are still breathing, but the mind is sort of already leaving the body alone. So that, to me, the, the, the best preparation is <laughs> you do a, a lot of meditation, beforehand do the uh, this kind of letting go exercises so that even as the body is experiencing a lot of pain um, and, uh, and you know, sometimes uh, there's uh, so much pain that, that they, they can't give you enough morphine to make it even uh, to dull the pain very much 
um, Lung Po Pli in one of the uh, very well-known forest Ajans in Thailand, um, they said to him, we can't give you any more morphine, it'll kill you. Uh, but the, the pain that he had from a, a cancerous tumor in his leg um, was, was really intense. But then people who went to, to be with him as he was dying said he was really cheerful and quite, quite uh, at ease. And even though there was this, this, the pain was so strong that they couldn't give him enough morphine to, to, to damp it down. But yet his attitude was extremely clear, peaceful, quite cheerful, and would be still talking with people who were coming to visit him, even as the the body was in in great great pain. So uh, the, the the more that we can train ourselves beforehand, the more we do our homework, then when those times come, then we can let that process happen. Uh, if we it's the, if the attitude is like. I'm not ready for this, or this isn't fair, or this shouldn't be happening, or this has to be stopped. Uh, whatever, whatever can be done to make this stop, um, uh, a kind of desperation, then those kind of attitudes create more dukkha, create more stress. Um, you know, you're uh, rather like um, the the sense of inevitability, like the the. The, the boat is coming into the shore, it's arriving at the dock. <laughs> it's just, okay, the, the boat is drawing into the dock, it's going to be, uh, it's going to uh, come up and it's going to be, uh, uh, we're going to be landing you know, soon. <laughs> that, that sense of, of being peacefully ready for the changes that are happening, that's the most helpful and skillful thing. Um, the um, one of the interesting things that uh, I mentioned is what's called terminal lucidity, which is uh, um, um, uh, uh, an effect that can happen as the consciousness is being less affected by the body. Uh, sometimes someone who's been in a coma or unconscious or unresponsive for, for months or years, close to the, the ending of their life, they become conscious and they're able to, to speak and to engage. So that the, the technical term is terminal lucidity. The mind is lucid, is, is awake. Uh, and this has been noticed for hundreds, thousands of years. People have seen this happening. Um, and it, so to me, it's a, a sign of uh, the, the influence of the body. Uh, and say, the, if, a, uh, the, if there, a person's in a coma or the, their consciousness is being obstructed by kind of faulty hardware, <laughs> then at a certain point the hardware stops having an effect as the software is departing. Yeah. Uh, so my own grandmother had been in a coma for about four years and she would, she would wake up and occasionally have very unusual conversations with the nurses in her nursing home kind of in the middle of the night once in a while. But my mother went to visit her every week uh, for, for the last four years of her life and never had any kind of a verbal contact. My grandmother was just lying there with her eyes closed. And my, my mother went every week to see her and spend time with her. So uh, my, my grandmother had a, um, a growth in her cheek that was obstructing her breathing. And then she had, uh, and that uh, poor, uh, the poor breathing had resulted in a lung infection. And so they, the, the doctors who were looking after her said, well, uh, if we gave her the antibiotics that would treat the infection, that would probably kill her. If we tried to give her anesthetic to operate on the the the, the, um, the mole or the, the obstruction in her in her cheek, that will also probably she wouldn't survive the operation. We can try to operate or treat her, or, or we could just leave her leave her be, and she'll pass away naturally in about 48 hours. And they had a f meeting with the family and I said, what, what would you like us to do? So uh, my mother was there at that, that family meeting and they, she and her, her nieces and nephews and uh, sister-in-law all decided to let my, uh, my grandmother pass away naturally. So uh, after they'd had that meeting, my mother went to see her uh, in her room, in the nursing home. And, uh, and it was quite startling to my mother because uh, my grandmother uh, turned towards her, opened her eyes and said, thank you, and then died the next day. So not a word for four years, 
and then she knew the end was coming somehow and she was able to kind of rise to the surface and say thank you Patsy you know, <laughs> you've been a great daughter bye bye uh, so that um, is also even though there can be seen to be major obstructions uh, people in a coma or unconscious unresponsive there can be a, a in, uh, within there can be a a whole inner life that's going on but they just can't communicate so I feel it's very important visiting people even if they're non-responsive visiting, being there, being close by uh, speaking to them playing recordings of the chanting or chanting yourself as you go to visit things that are uh, meaningful to them um, To it all helps because even if there's like nothing coming back it, they, they can still be hearing and fully aware but they can't, can't get to the surface to say hello, thank you for visiting <laughs> I know you love me and uh, that uh, I feel is very very helpful so uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, dealing with physical pain and, and mental distress it can also be that the, the mental faculties are really scrambled like when Ajahn Chah, after he had his stroke, um, uh, at a certain point, he would uh, he he realized what he was saying sometimes it wasn't what he meant, and he realized uh, he would turn to Ajahn uh, Ajahn Sumedha and say Anando, oh, and then he said he he, he had great strength of will, so then he said oh. I said Anando, I meant Sumato. <laughs> and the way he described it, if you remember, um, uh, so sometimes he would say very strange things, but he knew he said something very strange. He was aware of that, that what he was trying to say came out completely scrambled and like nonsense, um, which would be, could be quite upsetting to people who came to visit. They say, oh, Lung Po, we're so unhappy, we're so sad that you've got such a, such a terrible illness. And he would some, say something like, uh, Red Tuesday, happy elephant. <laughs> I go, what? Is that some kind of mysterious message? And they say, no, it's just, uh, it's all coming out wrong. And uh, if you remember the old, te old style telephone exchanges where someone will be a telephone operator, they take a, a wire and plug it into a socket to connect a phone call. So Lumpur Chao's description, he said, the monkeys are playing around in the telephone exchange. <laughs> like there's a kind of tri a troop of monkeys kind of putting all their wires in the wrong sockets and sending the messages to the wrong place. So he could sometimes he could draw his faculties together to, to get a clear message across but most often it would come out scrambled so eventually uh, even though he could still speak uh, Ajahn Liam who was the second monk said you um, uh, it's distressing to people when they try to talk to you and you, your words are, are scrambled or confusing so it's, it might be better if you don't try and speak and so Lung Po said, okay. <laughs> and that was, a lot, that was the end of his, his speech. And then shortly after, he couldn't talk at all anyway. So that, that faculty faded. So that, uh, that someone like Lung Po Cha, you know, who was an, uh, known as an Arahant, that even, even an Arahant can have their wiring scrambled. You know, the, the physical damage is there. Inside, they're totally, totally fine but because the, the, the hardware is, is not working or is, is the, the system has crashed then internally they're fine but externally uh, the, the appearance can be that things are, are seriously out of order or, and, or they're, they're distressed so sometimes appearances can be deceptive uh, but uh, I would say the, the main thing to do is for us to, to do our homework <laughs> Uh, to be prepared so when that, that time comes um, then we're, we're ready whether it's a, a short period of time or a long period of time like the car crash I was describing maybe you just have one and a half or two seconds to play with sometimes you might have weeks 
But also, um, another kind of challenging teaching of Ajahn Chah was um, when uh, uh, one of the Western monks was, was with him when some people came from Bangkok village and said, Oh, Lumpur, Lumpur, um, yeah, old man Som is, is, uh, is about to pass away. Can you come and give him some advice? And Lumpur just said, Nah. <laughs> no point. Yeah. Call us when he's died and we'll come and do the chanting. And then this Western monk, again, a self righteous American, <laughs> Lumpur, that was really unkind. How can you be so uncompassionate? You know, that would have really made a difference. And, and Lumpur Cha said, uh, <clears throat> that, that guy, he this is like a total wasteful. He spent all his time gambling and drinking. He never came to the, the temple. And if he did, he would sometimes be drunk when he came here. You know, after a, a, a long night out, you know, he'd be kind of reeling as he tried to put the food in the arms bowl. You know. this is, he said, you know, if I went and tried to say, you know, okay, now let's do some mindfulness of breathing, buddho, buddho, that would just be confusing for him. Just, let him be around the, the people that he knows, the, the home that he's in, the, the sounds and smells and feelings of home, and and um, and, uh, and that'll be uh, that'll be good enough. The, the this monk uh, uh, Varapanya still took exceptions. I don't agree, Lumpur. That's not yeah. That, that that's uh, that's unfair. You know, that uh, I'm sure you could have you could have lent a hand. And he said, you know that. Um, when uh, when someone hasn't acquainted themselves with a the teaching and they, they really don't have uh, that they haven't built the the barami the paramita in their in their lives just to be kind of coming in with a a, 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 a teaching to saying this is good this is special this is important this is sweet um, they, it's not connected to anything they're familiar with it's not going to be helpful. And um, and so that then uh, he said he, he got his walking stick and he put it into the middle of Warapanya's chest and pushed on him and then kind of leant down on his chest while Warapanya was kind of lying on the floor. I said, I said okay, <laughs> so so now this is like uh, the 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 guy dying. So here, would you like a candy? And he picked up a sweet a little sweet. Would you like a candy? And Warapanya said, Oh, the boy. Can't breathe. Oh, look, you like candies. Why don't you want a candy? It's, a, it's going to be nice for you. Oh. But he was uh, struggling with, uh, with Lumpur pressing on his chest, kind of leaning on his walking stick. Uh, uh, and so he said, it's just the same that uh, you know, the, having a little candy, to, to, it's not going to make much difference. And it's only going to be confusing. So better for someone just to be left alone, be around the things that are familiar, that are comforting, and and uh, that uh, will uh, uh, it, uh, it, it will that will be the best for him. So I thought that was extraordinarily uh, practical. Also, um, you might think it's pretty hard-hearted, or surely some doing some chanting is going to be beneficial, but. Uh, he was really clear that uh, that was um, better for people just to be with, if they haven't made those kind of connections and those things haven't been important to them, better that they are with the things they, they feel at home with. Um, and just that's, that's what is going to help them to be relaxed and be with what's happening and to, to let go. And that trying to be something else or trying to, to um, Sort of add on something extra, something special, it is, is only going to be an intrusion. Maybe the last story to share on this, uh, there's a, a famous uh, meditation teacher, an uh, American psychologist called Ram Das, who was a, a disciple of an a Indian guru, Neem Karoli Baba. And he, was, he was a, a Harvard uh, University psychologist and then became a kind of um, uh, a meditation teacher and guru. Uh, anyway, uh, he was, he published many books on meditation. He's a kind of famous Dharma teacher and his stepmother was close to, to, to dying. And so he was with her and she's lying on her, her bed. And so Ramdas is thinking, okay, well, I should really give her some advice, you know, as she's, 
you know, her last days are coming, and you know, it'll be really, and you know, this is my territory. I've even written books about death and dying, and this is this is my field. So he's giving her this guided meditation about you know, following the breath in, bringing the light into your heart, and breathing out, letting, uh, spreading loving kindness over the world, and breathing in, filling your being with light, and and doing his sort of standard guided meditation. Uh, and after uh, and, uh, a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes or so, apparently she turned towards him and said, Ramdas, be quiet. <laughs> And he told that story. So, it's like, oh right, it's, it's it's her death, not mine. It's like it's not my program. But I'm doing my thing to do helping the dying. But what does this person actually need? What's meaningful for them? What are they at home with? And then that's what you're guided by. So I see we're just uh, just before nine. So let's draw things to a close. <coughs>